Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jackie Fitzsimons. I'm from OPSS. Um, welcome to this session, Shining a Light on Environmental Health, um, CIH Delivering a New Normal. Um, I was just thinking that um, in the good old days, we'd be ambling back from our buffet, but unfortunately, I think we've had to imagine we've had a virtual buffet today. Um, before I go on to introduce our guest speaker this afternoon, um, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, I've posted some information in the chat for you, um, but if you're not speaking, could you ensure that your camera is off and that your microphone is muted and that will avoid any background noise during the session. We are recording the session, so be mindful of that when you're posting in the chat. We'll share this with the delegates afterwards. If you do have internet or laptop problems, um, I have posted the meeting details there so you can dial back in through audio. Um, throughout the meeting, you're encouraged, please, please feel free to put any comments or any questions using the chat function along the side. Um, and you can use the raise your hand function to ask any questions if we have enough time at the end. So um, without any further ado, I'll introduce Kate Thompson. Kate's the director of um, the Chartered Institute for Environmental Health, director for Wales, um, and she's been a chartered environmental health practitioner with 25 years experience in local authorities in England and Wales. Um, and um, before her current role, she spent five years with the Food Standards Agency in Cardiff, um, heading up the local authority support and audit team. So Kate, if you're ready to begin. Thank you, Jackie. Um, just I um, how, can you actually see me? Can delegates see me on screen at the moment? And you can hear me OK. Um, I, I'm not sure that you can see my presentation, though. Can you see my presentation? You're not in slide mode. Okay. Right, because I've got I've had a problem sharing it. Um, is it is it can it be shared from your end or not? Let's see if we can do that, Sheree. Let's um... yes, I can do that for you, Kate. Just give me a second while I get it up. Thank you. Thanks. Technology is a marvellous thing. Oh, when it works, it's <laughs> great. <laughs> can you see that? I can't see the, the presentation, I know, but it, it doesn't matter if everyone else can see it. Yeah, can't see it yet, Oh, I think it's because I'm sharing my team screen instead. <laughs> <laughs> Not helpful, see yourself. Uh, da, da, da. Christmas song. Oh. <laughs> Christmas carol. Sorry, let me just cross it. It's not coming up on my list as being open, but it definitely is. You want me to try? Yeah, if you could, Jackie. Okay, just Somebody will get it up. <clears throat> Is that is that up there? Can... Ah, wrong slide, but it's the wrong slide deck, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. I'm thinking ahead of myself. Oh no. Nope. That's right. Right, has that gone up now for everybody? Ah, we ha we have it. That's there fantastic. We so we got there. Okay. Does does that mean that you're going to control my slides to control my slide because I can't when I need them to, yep, or am I able to control them from here? No, no, I'll have to do that if that's okay. Fine, that's okay. So right, let's just. Uh, roll back. So thank you, Jackie, for um, the introduction and good afternoon um, to everyone. I was uh, 
delighted actually to be invited to speak at um, this week's event and of course the challenges of speaking at an event like this at lunchtime is that it's uh, is to choose a subject that isn't going to send you all to sleep it's going to be useful and relevant and which hopefully you'll remember long after you leave today so I thought I'd mix it up a bit and cover the things in my presentation that is an organisation we're most proud of and the things that we most often get queries about from our members and um, about the things that are mo most likely to be of interest to uh, the wider environmental health profession. Uh, so next slide, a little bit about CIH. And so we are a professional membership organization uh, body for environmental health we're an awarding body uh, we accredit um, the environmental health qualifications like uh, the environmental degree the environmental health degree the msc um, as well as other qualifications for example, the higher certificate in food control. We also provide online workplace um, training in a range of environmental health related subjects and resources for face to face training. Uh, currently, we've got about 7000 members in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, as well as some members in Scotland, although um, we have a sister organisation in Scotland uh, called um, REHES, uh, which you've probably all heard of. Um, and we're often as an organisation called upon as the voice of environmental health. And We've got really excellent links with um, the national media and into government, which is always useful in supporting our campaigns and any lobbying work that we're doing. So we're a really small organisation. We've got a head count of less than 50, and that includes our commercial um, arm and um, all of our staff almost all of our staff were based in our central London office um, and um, like any other sort of membership organisation we are answerable to, to a board of trustees. Now because of the devolved nature of um, environmental health um, we have a presence in the devolved nations with myself in Wales and my Gary, my um, colleague Gary, Gary McFarlane in Northern Ireland and we both work remotely and have um, strong and close links with our uh, respective governments in Wales and Northern Ireland, with um, our respective public health agencies and with local authority heads of environmental health in the devolved regions. Um, I have to say, I think our links to our London office pre-COVID were um, for the most part quite fragile actually. Uh, and I've included the word culture on the slide because this is really important for us as an organisation. And I think it's true to say in terms of culture that CIH is sometimes, and when I speak to members across the country, it, it, they see us as um, sometimes quite England centric. Um, and for those people who, who um, live and work in the north of England, um, we're seeing or have been seen in the past, it's quite London centric. Uh, and of course, Gary and I make lots of effort to, to make sure that Wales and Northern Ireland perspective now is included in all that we do. Um, but uh, we, we still have this um, image, I think, of being England and London centric, which we really, really need to, uh, if you like, shake off. And the other thing in terms of culture, when we have spoken to our members really quite recently is that they said that we haven't been traditionally a very listening organisation and that the direction of travel of our organisation, particularly around professional qualifications, has left our members and if you feel like the wider profession quite confused and that's really concerning. On top of that, as a third sector organisation and as a charity, we receive no government funding. And of course, we're a discretionary spend for people. Professionals are not required to be members of um, our organisation. And we probably, more than most, have to keep a really keen eye on the bottom line. So in March, it became very clear that as an organisation, we had to do things differently with the stark realisation that to stay relevant or indeed survive, we needed to review our direction of travel, build strong links with our key stakeholders and focus on what really matters to our members. And that's really, I think, when the transformation of our organisation began. Lockdown saw the temporary closure of our London office. 30% of our staff were furloughed and those of us that remained at work were reduced to a four day week. Soon after that, our chief executive moved on 
and it all sounds pretty grim. But actually, it provided a catalyst to do things differently. We quickly mobilised all our available resources to focus on the COVID response because we knew that's what our members and the wider environmental health community would be doing. So as the only two environmental health practitioners in the organisation, Gary and my roles changed virtually overnight and our briefs were extended to include England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We established an internal team of core staff from across the organisation, those that were, that were left, um, and we started to meet daily um, to ensure that, um, you know, we were joined up on policy, in lobbying and in our communications. And all of this resulted in exceptional levels of engagement with members and the wider profession and contributed actually to a significant increase in new members to our organisation. So immediately our links to the wider organisation were strengthened. The CIH in England, Wales and Northern Ireland became one strong voice and um, we were able to really start meaningful engagement with professionals through the Chief Environmental Health Officer Group England, which um, hadn't previously been the case, with government departments, with key regulators and with other important stakeholders. And, and we're really, really grateful to all of you who've so willingly engaged with us. And that includes OPSS, who provided us with a real platform, if you like, to join up with primary authority officers across England to better understand the challenges that they have they have been and still are uh, facing on a day-to-day -day basis in presenting if you like um, up-to-date and credible advice to, to businesses so a hugely successful element of our transformation was the launch of what you probably know as our weekly COVID conversations and these are facilitated webinars with a chair and a panel of experts. Um, I call them experts. I think that's probably um, <laughs> a bit of a rough description. Um, but I, I, we, we all have um, expertise. In, in, we like to think in different things. And we're always looking for new members to join our panel of, of experts. And it's a great opportunity for any of you EHPs out there that really want to, to, to try something a bit different and cut your teeth. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're not that good, because I'm not. And, uh, you know, I used to lose sleep the night before a COVID conversation because you know public speaking just is not my forte probably in the wrong job but actually I did you know but as you get used to doing these things you, you do get better at them and you start to stop being nervous so I would say to any of you that would like to give um, give that a try and you know just get in touch with me and uh, we'd love to have you on the panel so we didn't limit our the access to our COVID conversations to members we opened it up to the, the whole environmental health community and any other professionals that were related to environmental health that um, sort of cared to come along and it's a really good opportunity for um, delegates to raise questions with the panel and literally have a chat and we never imagined in our wildest dreams that when we ran our first webinar, how successful they would be. And um, the figures um, on the screen, and uh, if we move on to slide four, actually, oh yes, we're here, slide four. Uh, the figures on the screen, we never imagined in our wildest dreams, um, the kind of numbers of people that actually join us on our COVID conversations. And um, these are the figures actually only up until the 4th of September. So, um, and I'm sorry, this is the most up to date I could get. So we've delivered, 40, we had delivered 44 COVID conversations between April and the beginning of September and uh, during that time just really short of 28,000 people had joined our live webinars and a further 16,000 had subsequently visited our website to view them not live. So we extended the um, concept of our COVID conversations to include other subjects because it was just a really marvellous way uh, for us to communicate with our members and the wider in environmental health community in a way that we'd really never done before. Uh, so the kind of things that we've um, covered during our COVID conversations are sort of port health issues um, and issues specifically for close contact services. So for the beauty industry, we extend them out to, to industry. 
So moving on to slide number five. So at the beginning of the pandemic, you probably uh, take your mind back. It seems a long time ago now, but there appeared to be um, a real vacuum in good quality information for, for professionals and for businesses as well. And we were able to mobilise our members and our advisory panels to produce what was at the time much needed resources, I think. Uh, which included guidance for takeaways, for shoppers. Um, our takeaway guidance was um, translated into Bengali, Punjabi and into Welsh. We provided guidance on Legionella and we provided guidance for the cos cosmetics industry. And uh, interestingly, our takeaway guidance has had worldwide, uh, worldwide appeal. And um, we were contacted by environmental health practitioners in New Zealand and in Australia um, who were really keen to use some of our resources, uh, particularly the takeaway guidance. Uh, the other thing that we, we did is we introduced a new weekly email newsletter that all of our members get. Um, and we try to provide um, updates on really topical issues. So for the um, version that goes out tomorrow, you know, I'm writing the copy tonight. So it really is, is relevant and we try and keep it relevant and up to date. Uh, we also sent emails to all members with urgent announcements as they arose. Uh, we've published blogs explaining the impact of new regulations and we've created a new dedicated section on our website for COVID related content and resources. So moving on to slide six. And um, our website during this time saw more traffic than ever before, with referrals from social media up 377% on the previous year. Uh, the coronavirus section on our website received almost 69,000 views, which for an organisation um, of our, our sizes is quite unprecedented. So moving on to slide seven. So, of course, uh, the media interest in environmental health during this time has absolutely rocketed and we really became the go to place, uh, particularly for The Guardian and for the Daily Mail for information and environmental health featured not just in national newspapers, but on national and local radio and television. We never turned away an opportunity to promote the great work of um, environmental health professionals across the country. And uh, I'd like to personally take this opportunity to thank every environmental health practitioner who provided us with information and advice, which enabled, enabled us to make this happen. Uh, because oftentimes, you know, it was really important for us to give um, contacts and friends support to just make sure that the information that we, we were providing was relevant and up to date. So what I would say to you all is to all of you environmental health practitioners on the call, this is actually your time. Your profile has never been higher in government. And despite the challenges you're facing on the front line, your um, how can I describe it? Actually, Catherine Priest described it really well, actually. It's a meeting. Uh, she called it your pragmatic and proportionate approach to enforcement has really been acknowledged by all um, at the highest levels in government and by the business community. And uh, what I would say is we must all work together to continue to raise awareness and demonstrate the value of, um, of what you're doing. So turning now to the environmental health qualification, if we can move on the slide, and the professional pathway. Um, our engagement with employers in the public and private sector and with academics confirmed what Gary and I thought to be the case, real confusion and disconnect, connect, discontent with the direction of travel. And so um, the planned closure of the environmental health registration in June has been held in abeyance um, and we received some very clear messages from employers. They told us that they valued the concept of a holistic environmental health qualification now more than ever. They value the independent verification of officer competency and they value the register of professionals. And on the back of that, we will be taking a paper to our board in January with proposals for a new modern replacement for EHRB. And that will be developed in consultation with a small representative task and finish group, 
which will ensure user requirements are a key consideration. I'm going to mention here um, a new standalone qualification that's been developed in the midst of all of this. Um, and um, it's a qualification specifically for um, officers that want to do just food. Uh, so this is not for environmental health practitioners. It's um, a modern version of the higher certificate in food control, and we will ensure that that qualification, when it's launched, aligns 100% with the FSA's new competency framework that they've just published for consultation. And we hope that the syllabus for that will be adopted by our accredited universities as part of the degree and MSc. Um, you might have noticed that the logbook or the practical element of that qualification was actually launched in June. And uh, the idea of that was to enable candidates, including environmental health graduates, to demonstrate their competency, which will be independently uh, assessed in a, uh, an independent interview. And uh, we think that's really, really important. So moving on to slide nine to um, campaigns and initiatives that we've been involved in. These are just, um, just a little bit of a flavor in the last um, nine months. So uh, this time last year, we had our annual CIH Excellence Awards. Um, we've done some research around um, beauty, the beauty industry, uh, the fact that it's unregulated. We did a survey of regulators and we are lobbying for better regulation in England or of the beauty industry. We've also um, uh, did some research on primary authority and uh, published a report perspectives on primary authority. Um, we launched uh, a national environmental health volunteer register at the start of the pandemic. And um, there's some really important campaigns that we've also launched in the last few months. Uh, one of them, in I am environmental health, uh, choose environmental health, and um, environmental health together. Some of you might have heard of environmental health together. This is a brand new initiative launched two weeks ago. And this is, it develops, if you like, the concept of our voluntary register. And this is where environmental health practitioners or anyone with environmental health skills who's available for work can sign up to the register and um, uh, and, and um, make themselves known to local authorities that are struggling to recruit. And we've also recently launched um, our, our workforce survey because um, we are continually being asked by government and other stakeholders about the environmental health workforce, and we don't have up-to-date information um, or data on that. So um, moving on to slide number, number 10, and uh, of course, I couldn't really leave the presentation here today without mentioning uh, Brexit. And uh, uh, this goes back to, to last year. We, we uh, worked with the, um, uh, as part of the Centre for Food Policy, to publish two um, reports. Uh, one of them was called The First Feed in Britain, Food Security and Brexit. And we also uh, published another, uh, Food, Brexit and Northern Ireland Critical Issues. Um, at the moment, we sit on the UK Exports Working Group and have been able to be very influential on that group, securing access for local authority environmental health practitioners to training and uh, online training. Uh, we also currently sit on the Trade and Agric Agriculture Commission's Consumer Working Group, and this is looking at um, uh, important issues uh, and things that need to be considered in trade agreements going forward. Um, and we've developed some really close, valuable links with our port health community. And uh, some of you uh, may have joined our port health coffee and catch ups. So, um, uh, moving on, um, I couldn't really leave you without uh, just mentioning what I think are the future challenges for environmental health. And, you know, the one that's top of the list is workforce capacity. It's a really big issue. And a lot of our energy as a professional organisation is actually currently focused on, on this, um, this issue. 
uh, but resolving the confusion around the professional qualification is also really important to us as an organisation. We're under no illusion that getting this sorted could be critical to the survival of us as a professional organisation. Also supporting professionals through what are likely to be very, very difficult times ahead with public sector budgets and it's really really important for us that the profile of environmental health is maintained at a local and national level as we come out of, of this pandemic. Our engagement with um, employers in the public sector also highlighted the need to develop environmental health leaders for the future and this is a potentially very exciting piece of work. Um, environmental health practitioners, particularly in local authorities, need to be at the table when decisions are made, particularly around resources, because if they're not around the table, we've seen all too often that they appear on the menu, and that has to stop. Moving on to slide 12. Uh, I mentioned um, the work uh, we've done a little bit earlier around environmental health together. So this is a, a register at the moment. It's recently launched. We've got 200 individuals on that register. Um, it's a collaborative um, initiative between CIH, the LGA, MHCLG and NHS uh, Test and Trace. And this is a great resource uh, for local authorities if they um, have short term resourcing Problems. You know, there are people on there. You can search by a geographical area, by skill, and um, it might be a really good way to solve your sort of short term um, resourcing problems. So I would urge you to, to make use of the register um, and uh, you know, give us feedback on, on how you find using it. Moving on to slide 13. So we recognise um, the need to raise the profile of environmental health and on World Environmental Health Day launched a social media campaign to do just that. So um, I am environmental health, that was the name of the campaign. It showcased in bite sized sort of pieces on social media, the work of environmental health practitioners across the country. And this campaign is going to be ongoing. Just moving on. And we also recognise the need to attract more people into the profession. This is key. And uh, we launched a campaign called Choose Environmental Health. And this campaign targets people at different stages of their life. For example, when they're choosing their A-levels, choosing degree, choose going through clearing, and, and also those looking for a career change. Because one of the things that we're finding is that environmental health is, is a great profession for those um, for a career change. So we start to see a lot of interest um, from more mature students who um, during these really difficult times are looking for a career change and they're looking for a career which they believe is going to be um, sustainable for them. So um, we also just wanted to tell you a little bit, we also had our first um, uh, online careers fair in October and this was a, a really huge success and this was um, a very different way for us to do things. Um, so we had a, a great lineup of new graduates sharing their experiences online um, and that resulted in a lot of follow-up emails from delegates that had attended our online careers fair. Um, and all sorts of graduates actually, people and lots of geography undergraduates got in touch. I had emails from them asking, you know, me to give them advice about the, the, the best route for them into the profession. So just to tie up uh, my presentation, um, I kind of come to the end now and I wanted to finish off um, with um, a video featuring some of the social media material that we've developed um, as part of um, our campaigns and um, yeah, to support you really. So uh, if you can click on it, I'm ha happy to answer any questions that you might have afterwards. Let's see whether this works. To be honest with you, I can't even simplify 
it in, in 10 seconds. You feel as if you're making a difference. You're responsible for people's lives. You might have had this totally different. It, it, it was brilliant. I have absolutely no regrets. Growing up, I never knew what it was I actually wanted to do for a career. When I was in sixth form, I didn't really quite know exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I always wanted to help people and make a difference. I come across the term environmental health. Environmental health offered the wide range of opportunities. The variety of career options that you can have from uh, working within environmental health, it was so varied. You know, you study one degree, but you've got five potential career opportunities out of that one degree. It was the best decision I ever made. When I undertook, undertook GCSE, I did not like science at all. Once you're studying the degree, everybody's brought up to the same level that not having studied science isn't in itself a barrier to studying environmental law. But if I undertook hospitality subjects as A level, then I'd be able to do environmental health. There's people from a, a wide range of backgrounds. They were sort of, sort of pinpointing specific um, subjects that had to be undertaken during A level. got to a stage in my life, my daughter was doing her A-levels, and I thought, actually, I need a new challenge. Hi, my name's Sam Watkins. Um, I went back to university as a mature student to complete my master's in environmental health. It's a very diverse role. One minute you could be dealing with a housing complaint, the next minute with, um, say, being out on a food inspection. I think the biggest step is to apply to the university. Once you've done that, you've made that step. If people are wishing to change careers, go ahead and do it. It was the best move I've done. You've just learned so much. It's just the great opportunities you had. But best of all, it allows you to give something back to the local community. Honestly, it's the best move I've made. I just wish I'd done it 25 years ago. I am environmental health because I care about the present and the future and I want to leave a better world than the one that I came into. I am environmental health because I care about food hygiene and health and safety. I'm environmental health because I can improve the health of the public. I'm environmental health because I love working with businesses and protecting the public. it has a big impact. Everything that environmental does is the protection of the public and the environment. I am environmental health because I'm proud to make a difference. I am environmental health because I'm passionate about keeping the public safe but letting them live their lives. Hello. My name is Martin Walker. I'm currently employed as a Port Health Officer here at Suffolk Coastal Port Health Authority, based at the Port of Felix, UK. Initially, environmental health chose me. One of the great beauties is there is such a wide range of areas that you can get involved in, but it does give you the flexibility to move around. I think that's probably one of the greatest reasons for considering environmental health is the variety of work that you can get and choosing something that will suit your particular interests and desire. I think environmental health is important because everything that environmental health is geared towards is towards the protection of the public and protection of the environment. Given all the challenges we face with the growing uh, population, technological advances, food shortages, and I think it's important that people are there, such as EHOs, to uh, help protect uh, the world against uh, the threats and challenges. I've been in environmental health probably more years than I care to remember, but looking back, it's coming up to my 30th year of career. I know from the work that I've done over the past 30 years, I have seen uh, real improvements. 
I have seen unsafe foods taken off the market and away from uh, importation. I have seen noise complaints being resolved uh, to people's satisfaction, uh, and that's always extremely gratifying as well. I love uh, environmental health because it's offered me uh, a very rewarding career. There's a huge range of different uh, things that I can get involved in. I particularly enjoy going on board uh, the vessels uh, that call here at Felixstowe. It's considered that I'm going to learn something new every, uh, every day, and particularly on board uh, the vessels. I've been particularly fortunate in being invited to work with the World Health Organization, carrying out ship sanitation inspection courses uh, around the world. And when I started off, uh, my career in local government. I could never have imagined that I would be visiting places such as Nigeria, Russia, Morocco, uh, to name but a few. I've had the opportunity to travel uh, around uh, the world with WHO and to be able to engage with some incredible people doing incredible work. <laughs> it's been uh, a, a real highlight of uh, my career. and I'm an uh, Environmental Health Officer from Westminster City Council. Today we are in Winter Wonderland in Hyde Park and we're here today to conduct some hygiene inspections. Today we'll be looking at stalls that are cooking, some that are heating up food. We have plenty of businesses. Hi, my name is Anil Drayan and I'm from uh, Westminster Environmental Health Department. This event runs for 45 days. There's about 120, 136 temporary individual food units and 47 bars. We're looking at allergens. We're looking for two particular things. We want to make sure that the businesses are signposting allergen information and we're also looking for a matrix so which explains which food items are they're selling and what the contents of those in terms of the allergens advice i would give to members of the public would be looking for certain signs so for example do they have hand wash bacon how are the hygiene practices in store are they wearing gloves so are they wearing the appropriate gear are they washing their hands when they're supposed to be we also have to ensure whether there are any air quality issues that might arise. And so what we advise is to use, as far as possible, uh, fuel that is, uh, produces as little smoke as possible. This enables a, an event like Winter One Plan to demonstrate that it, it does take issues of sustainability, air quality, recycling, into account. Environmental health involves, uh, it's amazing, people don't realise what areas we get involved in. So from everyone at Westminster City Council, Merry Christmas and have a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone who sees this. <laughs> COVID-19 has caused loss of life and economic hardship all over the world. It has changed our habits and the way we live while testing our public health systems and impacting on our livelihoods. In the face of this, the role of environmental health practitioners has never been more vital as we face up to the ongoing challenges this pandemic is posing and do everything possible to protect our communities now and in the future.
that's that's me done. I'm the Jackie. I noticed there's quite a few questions in the chat. Would you like me to quickly work my way down them, or would you like me to? I've got a sort of a note of the ones here. We've we've got a, we're sort of just on the edge of time, but if people are happy, okay. to stay around for a little while, um, because I think the questions are a good question. Um, okay. so start with um Tony Tony Macklin. Um. Okay, I'm just working my way down the list to find it. Kate Thompson, why do you think that LA EHO's expertise were virtually ignored in England as compared to the devolved administrations to dump their feelings? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, why do I think? I, look, that, that I think it was. I just think it's a, a, a purely political decision. Um, for, for our part, um, what, what I, I just want to try and it's not going to give you any reassurance, Tony, but. Um, the first um, tranche of, if you like, track and trace, there were no EHPs involved anywhere um, in the UK, um, so they certainly weren't involved in Wales. Um, and then if you recall, track, uh, tra contact tracing stopped and then it was picked up again. Um, and just before that, actually, we um, met with um, the public health agencies in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, to urge them to use the skills of environmental health practitioners um, when, when the contact tracing picked up again. Now, um, we spent quite a lot of time with Public Health England, you know, um, explaining the benefits of that, um, but they decided to, to, to continue on the, on the road that they were on. Um, having said that, in, in Wales, uh, they took a different approach and whereas they'd used their own staff and um, in the first tranche of uh, contact tracing, they then um, obviously um, started to, uh, they, they, they say they, they transferred, they, um, the, the contact tracing was then taken on by local authorities and, and regional um, health authorities working collaboratively and it's actually, I think, really probably quite successful, but it is really successful, I think. Um, if you're looking at, you know, sort of the evidence from it, but um, Tony, I, you know, I, 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 I'm disappointed at the approach that, um, that environmental health practitioner skills have not been used to their full potential in England as they have in Wales. And um, I don't know the reason for it. It's a political decision. I don't think it's anything to do with the skills. I just think that, um, yeah, political. Thank you, Kate. And we've got one from Shamsul Islam. Any update on the apprenticeship scheme? Um, are there more, more universities supporting this? Um, yeah, so the apprenticeship scheme was rolled out at Middlesex University in September. And I understand there are um, a couple of other universities that are kind of um, almost there. Now, I believe that Leeds is one of them. But um, I, I can check, I can get you an, an up-to-date sort of situation report on the apprenticeships, actually, because I was asked the same question yesterday and I, I haven't got the answer yet. Um, so I think that's something we can put some information on our website or I can come back to you directly um, just to give you an up-to-date um, sort of situation report on apprenticeships. Really interesting, though. I, I'm really keen to hear what local authorities have to say about apprenticeships because we're getting a little bit of um, intelligence that, um, you know, whilst they are a welcome addition, there are still local authorities that are saying that they, they don't think they're going to be able to take on apprenticeships because they have to find their salary and their expenses. So the funding, the government funding, as I understand it, pays for the um, the academic element, pays for the university fee, but it still means that local authority has to, um, you know, find some budget uh, to pay the apprentice for the time that they spend with the local authority. So yeah, any intelligence, any information you can give us around that, and of course apprenticeships is um, is, is they're only in in England, they're not in Northern Ireland and Wales because that's devolved policy, and they haven't funded environmental health apprenticeships in those countries. So um, we'll be sharing the presentation afterwards and we can share your details. Kate, are you happy to take those questions? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah of so, course. Um, we've got Valerie on here who about what done by CIEH from BAME communities to join the profession. Um, do you know what? I, I don't know specifically um, the answer to that question, but I'm happy to take it back to our um, membership and professional development colleagues um, that might be able to give you just a little bit more information around that. And uh, I'm sorry I, I can't answer that question, but uh, like I said, yeah, take it back. Um, and a really good, good positive question 
Demon, um, can you point me in the direction of the Environmental Health Together Register? Of the what? Sorry, I'm just not. Um, can you can you point me in the direction of the Environmental Health Together Register? Of I'm course, yes. Um, I can provide a link. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps you should post that in the chat as well. That'd be really yeah, good. Of course, um, that's a really good one. So I'm just having a quick check through. Um, lots of positive comments about the video, which is really impressive. I have to say, it's really really good. Um, yeah, so I think that's the end of the questions, and we are slightly over time. Um, but thanks very much, Kate. It was a really, really good presentation. I think um, COVID conversations and reservedly a great, a great success in the profession. I'm an, I'm an environmental health practitioner, and the numbers and the views it's it's quite it's quite staggering, isn't it? Really, to see you know the people that found that a really useful tool um, during those sort of early stages um, of the, the pandemic. Um, and I think you've truly demonstrated, you know, that how environmental health practitioners and other regulators have been absolutely central to so many aspects, um, you know, throughout the last few months, really. And it's hard to believe we're sort of nine months, nine months along the way in the way that things have really, really changed. But thank you ever so much for an absolutely fantastic presentation. We will share the recording and we will well share the presentation afterwards um and uh, follow up on these couple of links so thank you very much everybody um and enjoy thank the you afternoon. thanks very much thank you bye